Welcome to today's edition of Pipeline Things. As you listen, this is a first for us on a lot of levels. It's the first time that we have a remote guest joining us, which means we learn about all sorts of technology <laughs> things. I think we lose the camera twice during the episode, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, join us as we talk about geohazards with Nick Roniger from Marathon Petroleum. And he admits openly on air that between the two of us, I am his favorite. We look, enjoy the episode. Uh, You're going to have a lot of fun. One. All right. Welcome to today's edition of Pipeline Things. I am your host, Rhett Dotson, my co-host, Mr. Christopher DeLeon. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, you probably noticed we're in a slightly different setup now. That's because, Ooh. believe it or not, we're going to have a guest on today's episode that we're going to bring in. And we're trying a couple of new things first time today. This guest is joining us remotely. It's going to be wild fun. Um, some unexpected things will probably happen. And um, we will give uh, Miss, Miss Producer kudos for doing an excellent job by the end of it, I am sure. Um, because you know, you know she's awesome. This? You know what I love about this? I feel yeah. like we're constantly learning new things on this, how to do a podcast. Man, I tell like, you what. Going, just a little bit of nostalgia, going back to nostalgia. like our first one. You know, like, you remember that? We had like the little lapel like mics. Eight months ago <laughs> when we were sitting in the tech room, I think it was. Yeah, yes. Yeah, was talking about IDT Expo, right, the first I episode. Oh my goodness. But today's going to be a fun episode, you know? So we, uh, we're, the plan's to talk about geohazard. Yeah. And so when I was thinking about that, for those of you who are down here in Texas, we just endured our second uh, harsh freeze. Which yep. So for people that come from further up north, they don't have an appreciation for a harsh freeze. Mm -hmm. That means that we got below freezing for 24 hours. And when we do, it's like a full-blown crisis down here. We, we're not built for that. Oh, my God, no. So i be real mm -hmm. with you. Guys, I was like in full paranoia. I felt like I was more prepared than I was in 2021. But, man, yeah. I mean, I was like up in the middle of the night running faucets and I was going to check Christmas lights. Um, yep. I melted my septic plumbing because two things of C9 What'd Christmas. What'd you do? Well, What'd you do? I wrapped my septic plumbing in mm -hmm. two things of C9 Christmas folds and mm -hmm. then put a towel on top of that and covered it in a tarp. It mm -hmm. turns out, uh, I can't show the audience, maybe Miss Producer afterwards can throw the photo up there of what happened, but you can melt PVC with C9. I, I melted Christmas enough lights. where my, my, my septic PVC like, plumbing think, is no longer straight. It's like You think that's why like Christmas trees can light up on fire? Dude, maybe so, but I didn't think it would happen. What about you? How'd you come out of the freeze? So in Snowvid, Snowvid, that was 21, right? Yeah. So yes. during Snowvid, I, I had I had lessons learned, right? So for me, mm. it was one of my my pumps, um, the inlet for my pool uh, cracked. So it didn't burst, but it cracked. And I didn't find out until my pool drained when, when everything was running. <laughs> so I was like, that's probably not hey, my pool's empty. Yeah. My yard's flooded. And then our water softener. Also, oh, that's, we, we yeah, have a, we have like a a little filter on it that also bursted. Oh, no, so, my whole water softener split last time. It was three grand down the drain. So, I learned my lesson. I went to Home Depot like the week before the freeze. I bought all the stuff I needed. Mm. I got home insulation. I wrapped my pool with plastic sheeting. It's yeah. fantastic. I got all my stuff done. Yeah. So I, I learned, don't know. I learned my lesson. That's good. You know, and actually, I'm reading the news now, like from Atlanta, they like Pittsburgh, like all these places are like going through what we went through two years ago. Man, honestly, I pray for those people because that stuff sucks. Yeah. I've been there, done we that. We learned quick. Man, I guess I don't Tomorrow, know. By the way, if you're there in Texas and you survived this year's freeze, good job. But uh, you know what? So and we're going to be talking about geohazards. We're continuing in our discussion of Rintu from the updated gas rule. And hmm. so for those of you who have been following us, we're actually going to be in section 613 today, right? So 613 is all about geohazards. And um, you guys have heard me talk a lot. You've heard the dirt merchant talk a lot. Yep. But uh, we wanted to bring a special guest on, get an yeah. operator's perspective. So I think we have to introduce, you know, our first guest. Our buddy. Our buddy. And this producer is going to bring him on. Uh, our guest is is Nick Roniger with is there Marathon Petroleum. Is there a way to do, like, the right thing where you, like, run Oh, down? that would be great. Yay! We can have little lights that you turn around. If you're watching on YouTube, you have you have no idea, actually, probably what's going on. There. Somebody's camera is going <laughs> to pop on here in just a moment, and their voice is going to come on. And I won't have to stall as long. It's fashion. It, you, know, you know, this is totally Nick being fashionably late. <laughs> it's just with you. Like if you Nick know was Nick, just listening. And if he was like, you I'm know sorry. Nick, he's the boss, right? So he's like, I'm coming on and I'm ready to come on. <laughs> I wanted to set the tone. Who's in charge? <laughs> well, you did good. I was like waiting. I was like, is Nick hearing me? Is his producer having problems? We have to keep stalling. That's so good. Um, I was waiting for my music to hit. Oh, that's oh, right. we got oh, the intro music, right? We, well, 
Nick, we will find a way to play special music for you during there that awkward go. moment where we were waiting for you to sign on. <laughs> yeah. So, I, it, it, I mean, obviously, thanks for joining us, bud. This is a you're, you're you first for, for us. Me. This is our. We had to find a way to get you on the show. So you're our our first. Is this what is this a? Is this we have to put tele on here? Is this the first tele podcast or how do we want to say remote this? podcast? Remote podcast. I don't know. We're breaking new ground, Nick. It's you're new breaking ground. new ground for us. That's right. Appreciate I everybody. appreciate that. Thanks for the invite. So, so what's your official title at Marathon? Give me because I always like to identify yeah. people with their official title if you don't mind. Yeah, so I'm the mainline integrity supervisor. Um, okay. my team basically creates the strategies for managing all the mainline integrity threats. So we manage geohazards, waterway crossings, depth of cover, cracks, dents. Uh, we do all our reassessment interval determination, technology selection, assessment selection pipe data, hydro tests. And then the big thing is, uh, our depth of cover program as well. I forgot about that. Oh, depth of cover. Um, that's a good one. That's that, a whole that's another a whole episode another getting into depth of cover. Yeah. It is a monster. And then, um, you're going to write it down. We also manage all the integrity data across the department. So, um, we have a couple, um, platforms that we work with. We have a, an engineer <coughs> that kind of works between our IT department as well as our integrity group. And it really kind of creates some unique solutions that that we have um, that helps us manage everything. Cool. Well, fantastic. That's Thanks neat. for joining us. So um, as an operator, one of our objectives here, now I want to set the stage with a bit of a disclaimer too. Yeah. So let's start with the disclaimer because that's the easy thing. So if you're listening to this podcast episode, uh, any opinions that Nick expresses are his own opinions. Yeah. They are not the opinion of Marathon Petroleum and he's not speaking on behalf of Marathon Petroleum and nothing he says should be construed as being on behalf of Marathon Petroleum. Um, so why do we do it? Because. We do it because of this. We like to bring on hosts that have sufficient experience there you go. to have really strong opinions and to be able to communicate those opinions. And so that's why we bring these guys to you for. So, Nick, again, by all means, we, we're, we're positioning this to where this is your opinion and, nope. uh, and nope. definitely not re necessarily representing um, – marathon in any capacity obviously it's nice for people to know how to contact you and what you do but, but. really i mean it's it's, yeah. it's the reason the reason we went with nick you know so that uh, the audience understands out there is i've worked with a lot of people on the geohazard front i consider marathon's program with regards to geohazards to be somewhat advanced i think when you talk yeah. about geohazard programs on scale in the united states you guys are definitely in the upper echelon i would say in the work that you have done and there are a lot of operators in the united states now who are starting from scratch by, yeah. I mean, ground zero. Uh, right now, again, I think the introduction to the Inga JIP on landslides, Dave Johnson wrote it. He did a fantastic job setting the stage for that. And he basically said that geohazards are following the same trend as SCC, where it goes from being like, hey, I've heard of that threat. Oh, to those people have that threat. Yeah. And we're in the stage where most people now, I think other people have that threat. It's not a threat on my system. It's somebody else's threat that they're dealing with. And so I think a lot of operators are becoming aware of the fact that, oh, no, this is a threat that affects everybody holistically. And I think people like you and other operators that are kind of blazing the trail have a lot to offer to those operators. And I'm hoping to get some of that out of you today. I, I think the big thing with geohazards is it doesn't it, it happens where you least expect it. It can be, you know, you think, you know, the highest risk locations are the, the Appalachian Hills or, you know, mountainous regions. It's not just that. It, it can be simple, you know, fields in Illinois that otherwise wouldn't draw your attention. Or, you know, we have a lot of work right away in the Midwest. And, you know, you, you complete a survey, whether it's a bending strain or, um, you know, a LIDAR. And you're like, really? That's there? That? that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe there's only one, but that's all it takes. So. Right. Yeah, and that's a great point of view. I'm thinking I got one in the middle of Waco, Texas right now. And most people don't think geohazards if you've mm. ever been to Waco, Texas, because that's about as flat as it gets. Um, so before we get into 613, Nick, I, I wanted to actually just give you the floor a little bit, you know, so because um, I think it sets the stage pretty nicely. If an operator is starting from scratch with the geohazards program, I mean, like they literally they have nothing in place because they're looking at this rule and maybe they're thinking they need to get something in place. Like what advice would you give them? Where would you tell them to start? What, what, what would you offer to them? I think the, and that's a broad the, question. Yeah, I think you have to break it down into specific areas. You know, what do you consider to be a geohazard type threat? And I, I think that the, the primary one that you could think of is, you know, waterway crossings. Waterway crossings are 
something that, you know, have there, there's been a FIMSA bulletin. There's been plenty of industry events that folks can go and read about. And, you know, that's something that as an operator, you have to stay on top of. Um, so I would say that, you know, that's, that's one key area. The, another key area would be, um, traditional landslip type geohazards. You know, when you, when you think of a geohazard, you think, okay, I got a hillside landslip. It's it, the, the soil is moving and, and then the pipe is moving. Um, and then the last one, which is probably, I would say, um, less, of a, a mainstream threat, but one that, you know, folks need to think about is depth of cover. You know, depth of cover is such a, a huge uh, part of an integrity management program. Um, when you look at the work that goes on in our right away, we share a lot of right away in tillable mm -hmm. fields. And that is a huge focus <laughs> because farmers don't have to do one calls depending on their till depth. And yeah. It, it, it takes, you know, erosion and, you know, a lot of our asset base, you know, was, you know, 50 to 70 years ago was when it was built. Three feet of soil, you know, 70 years ago may not be three feet now. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that, you know, when you get mechanical equipment crossing your pipeline in a frequent interval, you got to pay attention to that. So that's that's another factor. So I'd say those those three things are the the big starting points. And, you know, you say, okay, if you don't have a geohazard program, how do you build one? How do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? And mm -hmm. so, you know, I would, I would break it up into those sections and then focus on, okay, what does an extreme event look like for each of those scenarios? Yeah. I, uh, Nick, you, you, you really set the stage for us to be able to go like on so many different discussions. So really appreciate you doing that. Our focus right now on this arc is a lot around RIN 2 of the mega rule, right? So we all know the mega rule, three parts. They weren't necessarily issued in that order. We call this RIN 2, which is primarily focused on repair criteria, data integration. In this case right here, which we're talking a little bit more about, which is responding to extreme events, not just geohazard. We kind of want to build that into the geohazards. Mm -hmm. I want to zoom out a little bit because I, I think you touched on something here. A lot of your background's liquid yeah. and liquid, liquid pipelines, right? And, yep. and you guys, your integrity plants are just built different than gas guys, right? But you have exposure to a lot of the gas, you know, integrity management practices. Mm -hmm. So I'll kind of, I'll kind of segue it a little bit by saying, you know, that, that's where I started, right? 2008, gas pipeline integrity, IMP 1.0. And there was a significant component of pigging and digging. That's your integrity plan. Mm -hmm. And it's focused on your big three, dense, internal corrosion, and potentially inter external corrosion or SEC or whatever it was that you knew was bad on your pipeline. And it's pig and dig, Yep. right? And so the reason why we're here, we had significant incidents that drew new regulation. Right. But it kind of seems like the way the, the way you're, you're posturing this is it's you guys are on this clear momentum of continuous improvement and expanding your plan. Right. Keeping yeah. that kind of that mindset. Do you have any observations or reactions to you're seeing some of this requirements in the mega for the gas guys as a you know traditional liquid guy? What are some of your initial reactions to, you know, this more prescriptive based approach and some of the things being very explicit in the regs that are new to gas operators? So I, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing is uh, one of my favorite quotes is we learn from history that we don't learn from history. And um, can you, you give know, us a why, second to think about that? You got to give yeah. us a chance to think we about learn it. from history that we don't learn from history. That's like a that's like a. <laughs> A Murphy's Law version of history repeats itself. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. That's, that's basically what it is. And wh why I say that is um, one of the most valuable things that we can do is learn from each other. You know, mm. we, you know, we as an operator group, it, it's target zero. You know, we, we can't afford to make mistakes. We can't, uh, you know, we don't tolerate releases. Um, and you know, that's how it should be. And when I have a release or some other company, other operator has a release, we, we all have one. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to look at those events and say, 
okay, what went wrong? What went right? And how do I have um, procedures or stop gaps in place to prevent something similar from happening? And, and with that and how it ties to, to the mega rule, the mega rule has things in it that the liquids doesn't and vice versa. And so you have to look and you say, okay, well, is that threat mechanism unique to a gas operator or a gas line? Or do I share that same threat? And I just haven't come across it yet. And I think that that's a really important lesson learned where, hey, you know, gas operators, maybe they don't have the fatigue component that I would have as a predominant liquids, but I also don't have the SEC risks that a gas operator would in the same conjunction. That doesn't say that I don't have, you know, sure. uh, SCC to manage or they don't have fatigue to manage, but we can learn from each other where, Hey, you know, we've, we've invented that wheel. There's ways to manage those threats that have yeah. proven to be effective that we can all manage and, and use. And but, I think that that's a good segue yeah. because I think that this portion that we're going to talk about today appears in the gas code, mm -hmm. but geohazards don't care what's inside of the pipeline. Like I would say it, it's arguably maybe an ex external corrosion, maybe even beyond external corrosion, the most product independent threat out there, I would argue. Um, yeah. So, and again, it doesn't care what's in the right of way. It doesn't give you an electrical conduit mm -hmm. for all it cares. It's going to, they're going to be equally affected by it. So um, I want to jump into it, Nick. Thanks. See, I think that was a good, that was a good segue into it. Appreciate your, your, your observations there. Um, I want to jump into, again, for our audience, we're going to be in section 192.613 uh, that the of the updated rule that, again, is not technically a part of regulation yet, but has been released. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm going to... What's lead, the title? It is called Continuing Surveillance, which is interesting. So it fits between the current edition of... You go look at 613 right now, it's like razor thin, basically says mm -hmm. that operators have to uh, do some things. And I think we just lost our camera. So what we're going to do is we are actually going to take a break. We're going to hear a bit from ADV Marketing while we figure out our camera issues. We'll be right back. We're to doing this, producer. Podcast we immediately doing... got better. <laughs> we are doing this live. Hi, I'm Kara Turner. I am the managing director and co-founder of ADV Marketing. We get the honor of working with Rhett and Christopher to produce this crazy podcast and also work with them on any other initiatives that they have when it comes to marketing. And if you know them or are listening to this podcast, you know that it gets pretty crazy around here. So we have a lot of fun with them. ADV Marketing is a full service business to business marketing agency. Um, we specialize in service companies and technology companies. So if you are enjoying listening to this podcast and the fun that they're having, reach out to us and see how we can make your marketing fun. All right, welcome back to Pipeline Things. Um, we have a camera back. So a little technical difficulties. Thank you for those of you in the audience who are working through us. Uh, we, uh, yeah, it was it was a wild moment there. We decided to I'll call an audible, throw a pass, and um, take a break. So we're back uh, where we left off as I was just about to get into 192.613. I yep. thought we did a, 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 Nick did a great job helping us intro that. As we get into it now, so I'm just going to give you my observation, Nick. So I read through it. I kind of already gave you a bit of prep on where I want to go. When I read 613, I have a few immediate reactions that come to it, right? And I'm trying to take it on from the perspective of maybe somebody who has little to no geohazards background. So I think you're going to have a lot of gas operators who fall under this new regulation and they have not done one thing related to geohazards. Or maybe they've dabbled in it once, but very little experience. And so when I start in 192.613C, um, I'm going to read portions and then ask my question. It says, following an extreme weather event or natural disaster that has the likelihood of damage to pipeline facilities by the scouring or movement of the soil surrounding the pipeline or movement of the pipeline. So basically you have an extreme weather event that happens to the pipeline with a likelihood of damage. And then it gives you several um, types of events. It says such as a named tropical storm or hurricane. Y'all don't have those, but we have them. Uh, a flood that exceeds the river, a shoreline or creek high water banks in the area of the pipeline, a landslide in the area of the pipeline, or an earthquake, an operator must inspect all potentially affected onshore transmission pipeline facilities. So my first reaction to that, Nick, was it said, 
the likelihood of damage to the pipeline. So an event happens that has likelihood of damage to the pipeline. I don't, I don't like how you pointed him. Out of all of that, what was your reaction, Nick? I mean, he was animated. Are you leading? Yeah, am no, I leading? Just, what's your Nick, reaction? Nick, i got to determine which host you want to follow. Yeah, what's here? your reaction? Out of all of that, that's new. What's your reaction, bro? Uh, I, I like the challenge. And uh, I feel like uh, I can think on my feet quick enough to to take care of your uh, counterpart there. <laughs> so I, I'm good with it. Okay. But I like him better. <laughs> I don't know which one he's referring to, so now I'm confused. <laughs> not um, you. Not you. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but no, seriously. So again, that's for me, that's vague language, right? How, how does an operator know if they had the likelihood of damage? A hurricane came through. I don't know if I had the likelihood of damage. A high yeah. riverbank happened. How do I know if I have the likelihood of damage? It, it, it's it's very open ended. It's very ambiguous, and I think that that's really the the starting point for an operator. You know, you said, "Hey, you know, where where do you start?" Okay, you you got to have a baseline. You have to know and establish your your thresholds. F- FIMSA didn't establish what the thresholds are. They just said, "Hey, likelihood of damage." They gave some examples. Um, you know, there are some examples in there that you can utilize to help put framework around. One of them is, hey, a flood that exceeds the banks. So, you know, yeah. you can start with some of the easier, um, and, I, and I say easier, I would say, you know, more easily managed because you can say, okay, what flood event is going to exceed the banks? And you could either work with a, a geotechnical consultant or a geofluvial morphologist that says, okay, during a flood event of 5, 10, 40, 50 years, it will exceed the flood event. And so then you can say, okay, hmm. well, now I know what that means. How do I track that? Well, okay, there's you know the, the NOAA gauges. You can check and, and track, hey um, – What's the, what's the river at? And so there are ways that you can set up data alerts to say, hey, if there's a rain event, you've Ooh. identified your highest risk areas, which are your waterway crossings. And you can say, well, under these types of rain events, these flow events, that would be where you exceed the banks. And so you, know, you can establish alerts through those programs that you can then say, well, I received the alert. It's all automated. And now I can use that information to go and do my 72 hour check, which you haven't really talked about the 72 yeah. hour check, yeah, but you're building there. that. You're ahead of me, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so, so that's one example. So, you know, I, I gave you kind of the three primary areas, you know, that I would start with waterways being one. And I think that waterways are, are the ones with the most publicly available data to start establishing your baselines and your action levels. It, it's interesting that you put it that way, Nick, because what you're, what you're telling me, again, you described a program that's not reactionary. No. That's a lot of upfront information. That's potentially mm-hmm. watching flood gauges, that's setting up monitoring programs, mm-hmm. that's being aware of when a flood crosses a riverbank. Um, I'd say that that's not, that, that's not, A, that's not a little step, potentially, if you've got a decent number of pipeline systems, you cross a decent number of um, waterways. So th- that's number one. I, I, what I want, uh, what I'm hoping people hear is that there's a, there's a data collection and a threat awareness campaign that is an integral part to starting. Like, this isn't something you can be like, hey, we had a hurricane yesterday. Oh my God, let's go find out if it, it affected our pipelines. Yeah. You know, I mean, th- so there's two philosophies here, right? Which I think gets really interesting as a as a operator who doesn't have a program in place, right? Like they're kind of trapped in this chasm of I can have a time independent event that I don't know what's going to happen that I'm going to have to respond to, right? So if you know you have Snowvid in Houston again, you probably need to do some kind of O and M O and M activity, right? But on the other end, it's these are integrity threats that you're expected to have yeah. a plan for. And so, uh, you know me, I'm the procedures guy. You look at ASME B threads at 8S, and if you go to the back in Appendix A's or the, the A section, they have sample framework integrity plans for different threats. And one of those is geohazards. And all of them carry the same little loop, right? And the first one starts with what I think you just said. Gather data yeah. and integrate it. 
Agreed. And after you do that, you then either do some forward of threat identification or risk assessment, and then you go into some kind of inspection or integrity, integrity assessment. So really what you honed in on kind of inherently, which is great as a mature seasoned supervisor of integrity is it's, you got to start with data gathering so you can start integrating it, right? I, I think that you have to start with data gathering, but with that, you also need to document what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing that as an operator you need to do is have a program yep. and you need to have a program on paper that says, Hey, this is how I'm managing, you know, 192.613. Yeah. You know, because, you know, if IMSA comes and asks you, Hey, how are you managing that? And you say, well, you know, we, we wait for a tropical storm and you know, if it happens, then we fly the right away and we, we do X, Y, Z. Hey, okay. Yeah. You have a program, <laughs> but is it written? Is it documented? And then do you follow that? I think that's so is, the first step. Is it fair to say that's the difference between your O and M manual and your plan for addressing a specific section of code or an integrity threat. I think that's, that's fair. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that's a fair comment. And, and I think with that too is, um, you know, once you have it on paper and then as FIMSA performs their audits and you go through the process of your own internal audits and your own internal checks and adjusts, you can say, well, Hey, this is what we do. And then you can look at other operators or yeah. other failures that happen in, in, the, in the industry and say, okay, where did my procedure address this type of failure? Oh, it's, it's right here. Okay. So, you know, the failure was attributed to a geohazard after a, a big event. 192.613 was referenced as, you know, hey, a violation where the operator maybe didn't meet the requirements of it. Okay. Sure. Do we have something in our standards that addresses six one, you know, six thirteen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's the first step. Second step is, are our procedures adequate? You know, yeah. would we have stopped that failure from happening with our procedures? If the answer is no, then you need to revise your procedures potentially and, and improve that aspect of your program. Yeah, potentially. I would say that there's some things that can happen where you may not be able to prevent. You know, yeah. an, an episodic event in a previously unknown location, you know, that, or an episodic event. What's that? That, that you, you, you said that at the end there, a very important, uh, uh, unexpected or, you know, unforeseen oh, unknown location. location. Yeah. Previously yeah. Unknown, unknown location. location. That. So, so that's a, a great, a great comment where, you know, where do you start? You know, I gave you an example of where to start from a waterway program perspective, but you know, what's more challenging is a geohazard, you know, a landslide type event. Well, where that's am I going to have happened. a landslide? Yeah, that's not public, Nick. So again, they yeah. mentioned very public things like tropical storms. That's easy. Mm -hmm. Pipeline in the middle of right away has a landslide event. How do you know that you had the likelihood of affecting the pipeline? I, I'm, that's where I get kind of curious the, the program like, oh. maturity that's where you begin to separate the program's maturity right one where yes. there's publicly available information that is low cost and you can activate and then others where you really need to allocate resources and invest right yes. like you yeah. either have to run lidar or you have to run some kind of ili yes and, and and that's exactly right so when when you think about it and you say okay you know land slips where do you have kind of the traditional mountainous type terrain, hilly terrain, you know, and you, you can kind of check that box. And as you go through your program and you continue to mature it and you build it out, you extend it and you mm. say, okay, where can I get and pay for some of these more additional services? LIDAR is a fantastic resource that says, hey, where, where do you have a right away where you have a potential for having a landslip? And oh, yeah. just because you have a landslip doesn't mean you're impacting your pipeline. You know, it's a series of data gathering to your point earlier of data integration. Yeah. You can't just collect a LIDAR data set and call it a day. You say, okay, I collect mm -hmm. a LIDAR data set. And then maybe you collect an IMU data set that turns into a bending yeah. strain. Maybe you then do a site assessment, you know, and, yeah. and there's all these little things and you say, is this location stable? Is it unstable? Does it have the potential to be unstable? And now you've kind of built this out where you've identified your high risk locations across all of your right away. 
And that's what the ultimate goal is as an operator is, hey, identify your locations of, of risk. You know, where are you susceptible to these threats? How do you become comfortable with that level of susceptibility? And you build that out and you constantly have to build that out. There's LIDAR, there's INSAR, um, that's an emerging technology. Yep. There's bending strain and it's really just how detailed do you want to get? How mature do you want to get with your program? And then you say, okay, what is an a, a, a extreme weather event that could lead to a, a more pronounced or a, an instability look like? You know, okay, frequent rain, rain events. There's, um, you know, precipitation, you know, yeah. alarms that you can use. And there's different weather apps, and then there's local resources that you can try to to, to leverage. You know, all of that to say, hey. These are things that you can document as ways to manage and prove, hey, you're, you're doing your effort and what you should to, to meet not only the requirements of code, but to manage the integrity of the asset. So because a lot of time... You, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just I was, say, I, yeah, I was about to say, one of the things you said that I, I really like, Nick, is you're... And I don't, I don't know how much the audience is catching it because I think we have people that are on various stages, right? Mm -hmm is you mentioned several approaches, which actually gets into the second and third point of the code, right? Like you mentioned using LIDAR, INSAR, some of what I'm gonna call assessing the surface conditions. And there's technologies that can do that. Those give you one level of understanding of the threat on the pipeline. Then there's bending strain and IMU, which actually tells you what's going on in the pipeline. And I think mm -hmm. uh, a lot of operators will grab one or they'll grab the other, but, and I've seen you guys do a really good job of starting to marry the two of them, right? Because when you marry the two, you have a lot of surface-based things that don't impact the pipeline that you can actually, they're good for meeting the purposes of this code and being aware. But what operators find is if you take a purely surface-based approach, I'm going to waste a lot of resources addressing things that aren't impacting my pipeline. At the same time, if you take only a bending strain approach, you are often missing the information to tell you whether or not that threat is either A, really active or construction related. Yes. The two of those together do a fantastic job of helping you meet the requirements of this code. Where do I have threats? What are thresholds that I can use to, to know whether or not I need to respond to them then come from the type of information you're talking about bringing on? So I guess what I want to do is just pause for a moment. And we don't have to dive into it, but I want the, the audience to hear that, that as you start to develop a program, there's surface-based assessments and there's pipeline-based assessments. And the two of them, it's not one or the other. They're like two different legs that you, you need in order for the chair to work properly. Yeah. So. And I guess one way I'm rendering it is it's, it's this whole idea of, again, you can look at v 8 8S, the appendix, and see the typical framework, right? But if you break it down, in, in, and you can you can really like mirror all of your integrity threats to the same practices, right? But if we were to use it a little bit differently, I kind of one of the ways I feel like we could simplify it is that it's define and defend, right? I think yeah. Brian Jimenez did a good job of saying that on the last episode, right? It's like, hey, you have to define what you're going to do, and then you have to be able to defend it. And defend it doesn't necessarily mean cup half full, right, or empty. It's more... We need, like you're saying, Nick, you have to look at what's happening and defend why is my program good enough, right? Or how do I need to improve it? That's the first part. So that's the programmatic part of it, right? Define what you're going to do and be able to defend it. Yeah, I like and that. And then that allows you to then move into the other stages, which is closer to like one of the requirements we haven't talked about yet is like the timing of how you need to respond and when, right? So that begins to give you that basis of what activities am I going to then do to ensure the integrity of my pipe, and let's, right? Let's jump into that because that's a, a that's a great segue, Chris. So parts the next two questions I had, I'm just going to lump them solid together. Segue. Solid segue. <laughs> solid, solid, solid seven. Solid Send six. it. He's a solid. Send it. He's a solid six. Yeah. Um, so uh, in good lighting. In good. <laughs> so um, chin up, baby, chin up, right? Chin up. Chin up. Um, I'm still not sure which one of us he likes more. I think it's actually you. I'm, I'm, he, he's shaking my confidence to the core. I'm going to have to go back and listen to this episode and be like, I don't know what he's talking about. Um, so the, the next two points in 613, Nick, number one is it says that an operator must assess the site. So after this happens, you have to assess the a site and determine, determine an appropriate method for performing an initial inspection. And what's interesting is that the code's silent after that. It doesn't even give you such as, such as. It doesn't say, hey, perform an appropriate inspection, which may consist of the following. It just says appropriate inspection, which I thought was interesting because there's a lot of other places, just like the previous section, where it gives you some non-exhaustive list of things. And here it doesn't. 
And then in part two, it says you have to commence the inspection. And I think the word commence is both important and fair. But it says you have to commence the inspection within 72 hours unless you determine it's not safe to do so at the site. Mm -hmm. I want to hear your reaction to that. Number one, what's your reaction to having 72 hours to respond? And what types of things are you doing within 72 hours? Yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, I know I, if you call me and you need me out there within 24 hours, which that happens a lot. That's you're not gonna fun. you're gonna do it. I have, but I'm telling you, that's because it's Nick. I'd be like, look, if Nick called me, told me he needed me out there on Christmas Eve, I'd probably be, be out there. Because you didn't go over there, he'd come over here, and I know what that looks like. I'd, I'd come and grab you. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the reality is that you have to have a pretty established relationship or the internal resources. I mean, I got lots of things going on in my head. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go for it. Uh, no, I, I think the big thing is I look at the 72 hour mark as the initial eyes on the site. That's not the final, you know, that's just, hey, you need to get out there and assess the situation and determine from that assessment what your next steps are. Because so let me interrupt you, know, you there, Nick. Because yeah. I want to ask you a question on that. I want not. I want to. I want to challenge a bit, but I want to ask: How do you have the correct people internally to have the expertise to assess a given situation? A way to say that is: What does that look like? Not just from for yeah. you yeah. and your situation, but like begin to help us understand eyes on site. So do your corrosion techs know what they're looking for? I mean, is that you, you call somebody? Hey, party? hey, John, I need you to go take a look at the pipeline. Let me know if it's okay. Click. Yeah. I think that the first thing is, and and I'll speak to waterways, you know, cause that's, 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 I think the most automated that, you know, I'm familiar okay. with. So let's say you have uh, an alert come in and you say, okay, the alert came in where the flooding exceeded the banks. Okay. So at that point, you know, the hope would be that you understand what that means. You know, you understand what your depth of cover is in the channel. You've ran a, a scour model to, to say, you know, hey, you know, this is the scour that's predicted in, in various flood events. And so let's say you're having a 50 year flood event and your 50 year flood event, you understand, hey, from the models, how close am I to having exposure, a span? You know, what's that span length? Is it of a concern that, you know, vortex induced vibration could be an issue? You're not going to be able to get to that within 72 hours, but you can send, you know, folks on site and, hey, what should we be looking for? Okay. Can, is there debris in the channel at the crossing? Because if you have debris buildup, that can increase the scour at a given location. You know, yeah. if you have debris buildup, you know, on the pipeline, depending on what that looks like, that's additional load that you have on the pipeline. What do your banks look like? You know, can you look at the banks? And if you can, is there sloughing? Is there cracking? Are there signs of instability in the banks? And so those are things that you can do visually to then say, oh, we need to do a more detailed inspection assessment. Or in some events, you may say, hey, look, we need to shut down. You know, we don't mm -hmm. have a good way of looking at this. There is enough going on here that that we need to shut down. And it's really hard to frame up what that looks like. You can't really put that on paper. That's where you have to have a relationship with your field operations. They're your eyes and ears. And they need to get you the information back to the SMEs that can make that determination. Okay. And, and, and that's the gray space, Nick, right? Yep. Because, that's the gray space. Because that's outside of your, your def, define and defend. Because you don't, it's time independent, right? You don't know what you're going to find. Well, I've defined that my response within 72 hours is to do a visual assessment of the location or 72 hours within it's safe. And with that information, then yeah. I can determine, hey, you can, you what's can determine next? a response like, hey, do I need to shut down? Do I schedule an assessment, et cetera? So what Nick is doing is basically yeah. saying that his appropriate method for performing an initial inspection is to do what he just said. Exactly. Put visual yes. eyes on it. Yeah. And what I'm what I'm bringing up is that I think that. But again, see, Nick says it like it's so easy, and I think that's where I, I don't want operators to miss that, Nick, because you mentioned a whole lot. You mentioned being aware of the threat, looking for. You actually said you're telling them what to look for. Yeah. That's not. Yes. Hey, we had a hurricane. Go check the pipeline crossing in the Natchez River and just make sure it's okay. 
That's <laughs> no, it's that it, totally it, different. But I hey, it looks people, okay to me. Yeah, no, from people starting from zero. <laughs> and, and I Alex know exactly and, what Nick was afterward. Alex you're an idiot. And I, but Alex and I have talked a lot about this. <laughs> if, if you're not familiar with the threat, you don't know where to start. That's what a lot of people might might do. And so um, there, there's a lot of information that went into your just go put eyes on it comment. Yeah, it, but I think what we're sensing here, right, is it's that's the confidence. And the the efficacy of having a mature program, right? And 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 I think that's kind of why you know what we're doing here is important. Is so that the users or the here the people that listen to the podcast is like, for some of you this is new, and and it's important for you guys to understand that there's people that you can reach out to and get help from. So so this is great. We have another first. I don't know what the viewers are seeing, but I'm curious if they're seeing what I see, which is in reverse. Change or charge battery? In reverse. I think this is the technology's way through this producer of telling us that we are we are we are done with this episode. We, so yeah, we can do a different way. Um, yeah, no, yeah, I'm gonna no, no. switch to the FaceTime HD camera here. Let's see what happens. Oh no, it's 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 not gonna work. Okay. Nick. We actually got through most of what I wanted to get through today. Give him a chance I to think wrap up. The big, I, yeah, I'd give Nick a final final word. Um, the big thing I'm hearing about is there's a lot of data integration that goes into having a mature program. It's not as simple as saying, hey, I don't have that threat. Um, and, and operators, if they're going to have a hope of meeting the 72 hours, like you make it sound so easy to do, they've got to have done some homework before. And so um, I, I think, you know, to try to keep it as simple as possible, you know, we talked about, hey, here are things that you can look at. I think at the end of the day, you know, to simplify your response criteria is how, what are the failure modes? You know, how can you have a failure in a pipeline at a given location based on a given event? And, and I give yeah. a waterway as an example, because yeah, there could be one-offs, but in general, you can say, well, it's going to be scour. It's going to be maximum allowable span length, too much loading on the pipe, it, it, you know, vortex-induced vibration, uh, bank instability, yep. et cetera. How is that Nick. going to fail? And you can think through how are those going to fail, and that's how you can frame up how are you going to do your assessment because your assessment is going to be addressing you know, those failure modes. So I, I think that that's an important way to try to simplify your approach. And, and I think the other important thing is, is, you know, there's two aspects to anything written in code. There's the literal interpretation of what code and the requirements are. You know, in this case, hey, go do this, the 72 hour. It doesn't say what that inspection is. You can define that and then defend it to your point earlier. But that's the one side, that's the regulatory side. But the integrity side is the efficacy of that inspection, of that assessment. And you can't yeah. just stop at that visual. You do the visual and then you can build out and say, okay, what else do I need to do based on that? Maybe it's nothing, but that's where you have to integrate all your data and look at your different failure modes as part of that final assessment. Yeah, that, 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 that was great. And I think that's um, a good spot for us to leave that with, our, with our, our, our listeners and our users here. We would just say again, Nick, this is awesome. Thanks for sharing y'all's experience and just that confidence in, in where operators can get to as they start building their program out, you know, one step at a time, eat the elephant one bite at a time. And, um, man, this is great. I think we need to do it again. Yeah, I definitely think, Nick, we need to have you on again if you're willing. So Absolutely. Um, I appreciate well, it. Fantastic. Well, hey, appreciate to our the, audience. The dialogue. To our audience, we, we're going to keep bringing on guests. We want to say thanks for joining us, Nick. Thank you so much for being with us. Again, next time, you, you, hey, next time we do it, we should just do it this way. It's just me on camera. It might get better, uh, <laughs> better views, right? All right. Can we silence Nick? Because I am your host, <laughs> Rudd Dodson, my co-host, Christopher DeLeon, and the only person you see on camera, Nick Roniger. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you again in two weeks. <laughs>